Okay, you should just see the notification that the meeting is being recorded, and this will be up on YouTube later today. So my name is Vinyas. I'm a fourth year MBPhD student at the University of Toronto, and one of the learner co-leads at the Tamarity Center for AI Research and Education in Medicine, at TCARM. Today we have another one of our trainee round sessions. We have two wonderful students from U of T who applied to share their research with all of you today. And we're really, really excited to have them here. So first off, I'll introduce Anastasia. And uh, just before that, the format of the day will be 20 minute presentation no, followed no, by 10 minutes no, for questioning. Um, please remember to mute yourselves. Um, and if you have any questions, please drop them into the Zoom chat or raise your hands and I'll call on you during the question period. So first off, we've got Anastasia presenting. Anastasia is a PhD student in computer biology, computational biology and machine learning, working at U of T and the Vector Institute. Her research focus is computer vision and biomedical imaging. So Anastasia, please share your screen and go ahead. Hi everyone, and thanks a lot for the introduction, Vinyas. So let me share my screen and we're going to get started. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Perfect. So today I'm going to talk about discovering gene disease relationships with deep learning. And here's the roadmap of my presentation. I'll start with the background. I'll give introduction about genes, interactons, and disease hubs. Then I'll talk about predicting gene disease relationships. After that, I'll talk about our proposed deep learning-based approach. Then I'll show you our results. And finally, I'll conclude with conclusions and future directions. So let's get started. I'm going to start with the background. So a lot of genetic diseases are caused by a group of genes rather than a single gene abnormality. So a lot of diseases actually have a complex genetic basis. Sorry. An example of that is, sorry? An example of that is autism spectrum disorder. So um, in the blue box, you can see I'm showing some SD susceptibility genes, say it's from gene one to gene two and up to gene thousand. So all of those genes can somehow interplay and cause alterations of brain structure at the cellular level. And with those alterations, individuals can get a variety of SD symptoms. So that could be social function deficit, repetitive behavior, and so on. And degree of severity of those symptoms is determined by contributing genes. So just to give you an example, if only one of the genes is altered, then brain structure is changed just a little bit and individual gets less symptoms. However, if a lot of genes interplay, then it leads to a lot of alterations of brain structure and also more severe symptoms. So the big question here is, how can we discover such group of disease-associated genes? And the good news is that we actually have an answer. So a group of disease-associated genes tend to have similar biological functions and also interact with each other. And this has been recently supported by a lot of incoming papers. So one of them is science paper from 2015 that talks about uncovering disease-disease relationships. And those interactions between genes and proteins are usually described using something called interactomes. So interactomes are biological networks. And let me just give you an example of interactome. So the simplest example of interactome is the PPI, or protein-protein interaction network. And imagine you have one protein. And it can be closely interacting with some other three proteins, for example. So in this network, the closer two proteins are, the smaller is the line between them, it means the stronger connections they have. So maybe all of those proteins form some sort of a protein complex and are joined by a shared function. And this was just an illustrative example of a PPI. So let me show you the real one. So on the right of the screen, you can see first human PPI. Let me just zoom it in. It's a very densely connected network of a lot of proteins. And what you can see here is it has some densely connected hubs. And usually those connected 
gene and protein hubs um, contain genes that are functionally related. And such functional related genes are also associated with the same disease, forming something called a disease hub. So if we could translate this protein-protein interaction network into a disease network, we would get something like following. So on this screen, I'm showing you the human disease network. Uh, this work was published in 2007. And each hub here, um, the size of the hub depends on the number of the genes involved. And what you can see, we have a lot of cancer hubs on the bottom left part of the screen. So we can see leukemia, which is a blood cancer. We can see colon cancer, breast cancer, and a lot of other smaller hubs. We can see a lot of different other diseases. We can also see hubs of muscle diseases on top, like cardiomyopathy and muscular dystrophy, and so on. So basically, those human disease networks, they serve two major functions. First of all, they help us to understand genetic basis of many diseases much better. And secondly, we can also find relations between different diseases. If we have some unknown genes and we can annotate them to a hub, then we can find connections between unknown genes and some known diseases. All right, so that was the background. And now I'm moving to the second part of my talk, which is predicting gene disease relationships. So we can discover functionally related genes and construct an interactome using a lot of different sources of data. I was just talking about protein-protein interactions, but data can come from genetic interactions, gene expression profiles, and even imaging data. So in this talk, I'm going to particularly focus on imaging data as a source of data that we can use to construct an interactome. And the whole idea here is that protein with similar functions tend to localize to the same place in a cell. So we can leverage the similarity between fluorescent microscopy data and construct a network of interactions based on this. So just to give you an example, those are images of human cells with fluorescently labeled proteins in white. And you can see Golgi proteins on the left. So those are two Golgi proteins as they're forming some punctate structures on a, uh, near the blue nucleus. And also you can see on the right some cytoskeleton proteins, which have a really different shape. So this is just to prove the point that based on visual similarity, we can distinguish functions. And big advantages of image-based interactome is first of all, it covers a lot of genes. So just to give you an example, human protein atlas covers around 65% of human genome. And second is that it contains information about gene relationships at various levels. So it can be from cellular components, which is the top level, to bioprocesses, which is a little bit more deeper, and even to protein complexes, if you have enough resolution of your microscopy data. One problem associated with using imaging data is it's hard to derive similarity from it and also usually it comes in really big quantities which are hard to analyze. So the good solution here is to use deep learning approaches, which are known to be able to grasp tiny intricate patterns from the data and also being able to process a lot of data at once. So let's move to the proposed deep learning based approach. All right, so the goal of my approach is to extract functional information from the image in some sort of numerical form. So this illustration shows you the pipeline of my method. So in this example, we're starting from an image of a fluorescent labeled protein, and then we're passing it through a convolutional neural network. You can see how the network learns different patterns of the input image, and it subsequently transforms it into a series of activations. And finally, it converts into a vector of features which I call feature profile. So the objective of my network was to predict the actual protein. With this unsupervised objective, we can actually learn all the different patterns without relying on human annotated standards. So we can use all the data that we have, all the input data, and we don't have to limit it based on any standards. And we don't have to also incorporate human bias that usually comes with labels. So those feature profiles are shown as 
blue here. And those contain numerical information about the image. And what's good about feature profiles obtained from neural networks is that they don't ha have human bias, first of all. Um, they're fast to train, and also they don't contain some noise. For example, um, we don't have any information about um, some input screen noise or localization of a cell in the image. So we're only learning patterns of the fluorescent labeled proteins here. So just to give you an example of how this um, network works, imagine we start with a lot of different uh, fluorescent la labeled proteins data. And uh, in this example, I'm showing you the in-house data set from my lab. And we're starting with a lot of different images. Then using the neural network, we can convert them into feature profiles. And those feature profiles uh, contain information about the image in numerical form. So we can use some sort of similarity score to cluster them. For example, we can just use Euclidean distance. So each of those images can be clustered accordingly to their pattern, to their phenotype. And from here, I want to go to our results. So we train this convolutional neural network and we used a well-studied collection of these genes. So our data set contains more than 4,100 genes, which covers 76% of his genome. It also has more than 1 million cells. It was done using live cell imaging. So all the cells are alive here. And also, and also it's an in-house data set produced at Brenda Anders Lab at University of Toronto. So the reason we decided to start with these cells as opposed to human cells is because this collection is really well characterized and we could dissect how our method works at different levels and we could map it to different standards and see where the drawbacks and where the advantages of our method. Also, I'm going to show you some of the downstream analysis now. And all of this analysis is conducted on the test data which has never been seen by the network. So let's get started. So this is one of the first of our results. This is whole genome dendrogram. And basically, you can see uh, that one gene corresponds to one feature profile, which is averaged across all cells. So we have all of the genes on x-axis and all of the individual features on y-axis. So we can cluster the genes accordingly to their feature profiles. And this leads us to this sort of global hierarchy. And this global hierarchy actually explains how cell works at different levels. So for example, um, in this illustration, this hierarchy was cut at the top level, which reveals nine different clusters and reached for cellular components. If we cut it at a deeper level, we can get enrichment for bioprocess, pathway, and even protein complexes. Um, so the overall idea of this picture is that feature profiles can actually resolve organization of a cell, and they contain information about cell functioning at the different levels. And just to show you some go enrichment for those clusters, we can really see that each of them is enriched for, for different cellular component, ranging from nucleus, mitochondria, and Golgi, and up to nucleolus and cytoplasm at the end. All right, so that is the first result. If we look at this um, whole, uh, whole genome cluster map as a TSNI, we can see something like this. So basically, this is a TSNI and it's colored by different cellular compartments. And what we can see here is different compartments for, form different patches on this TSNI. So mitochondrion is shown as a green island over here. Also nucleus is shown as a pink part of the TSNI. Blue corresponds to cytoplasm. Yellow is ER, and so on and so on. So basically the method was able to resolve the organization of the cell and put different proteins accordingly together. And if we look at a more detailed level, level of cellular organization, for example, bioprocess, we can see something like this. So this TSNI is again a copy of this TSNI, but it's showing you uh, 28 different bioprocesses. And what's interesting about this is that this method can resolve subcompartmental organization of a cell. So if we look, for example, into the nucleus part of the TSNI, we can see three different bioprocesses happening there. And they all happen at a different place. Similar thing happens with the cytoplasm, 
mitochondria, ER, and a lot of other compartments. So we're able to grasp functions of the cell at really different levels. All right, so this was about average cell profiles, but what if we look at our data at a single cell level? So on this TSNI in the center, I'm showing you the single cell TSNI of our method. So I would map all of the cells that I have in my test data on the TSNI. And I would color them again by localization. So we see this TSNI resembles the previous plot that I, that I have shown. We can also see mitochondria in green, cytoplasm in blue, nucleus in pink, orange stands for nucleolus, yellow for ER, and so on. And if we zoom in some regions of this TSNI, what we can see is we can see different protein complexes clustering together. And that's really interesting given the resolution of images that we have. So yeast cells are much smaller than human cells. And still we were able to grasp those relationships between proteins just from their microscopy data and find protein complexes at different parts of the cell. So we, what we can see here is um, all of the different, um, the different colors stand for different protein complexes. And you can see it's a whole color palette that would color different genes by a different uh, shade of some color. All right, so this is single cell TSNI. Those are protein complexes. And what's interesting about this is also some of the protein complexes are known to be participating in some disease formation. So for example, this COP1 complex on the top, it, it, has known, it has been known to be part of Alzheimer's disease. If we look at this CCR0 complex on the left, we know that it's, um, it can be causing something called the myocardial repolarization, which is a heart disease. Other complexes, for example, peroxisomal uh, complex causes Zellweger spectrum disorder, which is a peroxisomal disorder, and so on and so on. So you can see that by altering some of the intricate parts of the cell, for example, protein complexes, we can end up with having a disease. And if we compare our method to other approaches, we can also see that we're outperforming some existing methods. So we compared it to some of the supervised methods, unsupervised methods, and also very famous cell profiling methods. And uh, we compared our method across all of the different standards ranging from cellular component to bioprocess to pathway and protein complex, and we would get improvement in performance across all of those different tasks. All right, so just to sum up the results, um, here we proposed a novel and supervised approach to construct interactome using deep learning and imaging data. And we validated it on a well-annotated yeast data set. And our approach can detect functional relationships between genes and proteins at various levels. And also our approach outperforms existing methods. So from here, I'm going to conclusions and future directions. So our next steps are actually applying this method on the human protein atlas. So currently we're applying it to annotate human cell data and we're using something called human protein atlas, which is a very big collection of antibody stain proteins. It has more than 12,000 proteins in total. And this would be the first attempt to create human interactome just from imaging data and deep learning. So this would result in a novel gene disease network that would incorporate more than 1,000 genes that did not appear in the existing interactomes. All right, and from here, I'm going to just end up with the conclusions. We know that most diseases have a complex genetic basis, and we can discover groups of disease-associated genes using interactomes, biological networks that describe interactions between genes and proteins. Here, we just proposed a new way to build an interactome using imaging data and deep learning. And the proposed approach has been validated on the well-characterized yeast data, and it also outperforms existing approaches. Currently, we're applying the method on human cell data, and the resulting network will uncover novel disease-related genes. It will uh, lead to novel gene disease relationships, and it will extend our understanding understanding of the genetic basis of various disorders. 
So from here, I want to thank everyone who came to this presentation and thank all my collaborators. Yes, yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much, Anastasia. That was a wonderful talk. I very much appreciated the, the care which you compiled all these figures. They're really interesting. So let's uh, kick off question and answer. Do we have anyone who wants to start? Maybe the TKRM adjudicators first? Yeah, I'll, I'll start it so people can, uh, can uh, you know, shake their nerves. Uh, yeah, so great, great, great talk. Uh, I guess I have a question about um, the actual information that's being used by this model. So I, uh, I don't think I've stained a cell since undergrad, but I imagine that these uh, proteins are all being stained through different sort of mechanisms, different like actual lab protocols. And I wondered to what extent you, you, you um, have or are considering determining how much the deep learning method is dependent on the actual protocol to uh, stain the protein versus the actual, say, structure of the protein itself. So I uh, thank you for the question. I think this is really a wonderful question. So let me answer this. Actually, there are two ways we can get the fluorescently labeled proteins. So the first way is we can attach a GFP, like our other fluorescent tag to the protein. And then we can end up with live cell imaging. And the function of the protein will be altered minimally. So that's what I have with my cells. Currently, I'm using live cells that, were, that have a fluorescent tag on them. Another way, as you just said, is antibody staining. So when we use antibody staining, the cells will be sort of dead, and uh, we can look into those proteins, but they will lose some sort of data, like, for example, expression amounts and so on. So this would be a different type of data. Um, currently in my work, I stick to the live cells just because they're so much closer to the healthy proteins, if we can call them such a way. But in my future work, what I'm planning to do is I'm planning to integrate different types of data sets and train the network across different data sets to grasp the maximal amount of patterns that we can get. Well, thank you. I think someone has their hand up if you want to just put. Yeah, Ahmed Reza, please go ahead. Uh, yes, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Yes, uh, thank you for the great presentation. I just have a quick question about this slide, actually. Uh, I was wondering uh, what the last function uh, was in your proposed deep learning, because you mentioned that uh, it, was, uh, it works actually in an unsupervised manner. So I was wondering what kind of a last function you use to uh, optimize to reach the best parameters of your neural network. Right, so that's a, that's a great question. So before I jump into the technical details, let me know what I mean by supervised and unsupervised. So usually when we have some imaged data that we obtain from our microscope, we know what kind of protein is labeled. So we get those protein tags by default. So if we have this image of some fluorescent labeled protein, we would definitely know what kind of protein we can see in the image. Um, what I'm talking about um, supervised approaches is that approaches that can use some extra information, for example, localization label. Where does this protein go to what compartment in a cell? Or maybe some bioprocess label. What bioprocess is this protein part of? Maybe some um, protein complex label or some other sort of labels. Actually, the localization labels are usually obtained manually for those type of images. And that's why I was talking about human bias. So then supervised loss here is just driven by those protein labels that we obtained by default. And the objective function here for this network is to predict the actual protein from the input image. So basically, we have the softmax here. And uh, that would be our loss predicting the actual protein from the image. In our case, we have around 4,000 proteins. So the probability vector would be 4,000 dimensional vector. And we're trying to predict which one of them is the input image. I see. Thank you so much. You're Can welcome. I just follow up? Uh, have you looked at multiple Sorry. instance learning at all for this problem? Uh, I have been looking into multiple instance learning. Um, it doesn't apply that well for this problem, just because we, because we don't have that many like instances of the same class. But um, right, overall, it's a good future direction, and it can be also applied. So this is definitely a good point.
So we had a, another technical question in the chat from Shadi. Could you mention with how many optimum layers in this approach you got the highest accuracy? Right, so that's also a very good question. We tried a variety of different architectures. Um, so we were trying from, I think, um, 10 and up to hundreds of layers. We also tried um, different networks from dense nets to ResNets, VGG architecture. So what really works well so far is uh, residual blocks, so ResNets. And usually we can get optimal performance with around um, 30 and more layers. Yes, is it just to answer the technical details? Great. I also had a quick question. Thinking about, you know, putting this pipeline into use uh, and when other people hopefully want to use this, um, let's say you're using human data and a person is interested in really dissecting interactomes in a specific part of the body, for example, the heart. How would you set up your pipeline so someone could, you know, bring in their own images, maybe using or in an area that your existing data set doesn't capture very well, but could leverage information this network has learned from East or the human atlas that you mentioned, how would you make it usable in such a way that someone can provide their own data later on? Right, so I think that's a great question. And we're also thinking about this direction because I really think people want to explore it. And in this case, we have two scenarios. One is ideal scenario, and second one is more realistic. So in an ideal scenario, we can train our network on a wide variety of different data sets so that, um, so that once people have their own data, they can just use the pre-trained network and it would give the ideal feature profile, which they can just embed in the interactome and see what kind of connections it has with already given data. Um, however, given the limitations and differences between microscopes and so on and so on, Probably the more realistic way to do it would be to do some second round of um, learning. So for example, our network was trained on um, several data sets and we know it performs well. And then somebody wants to bring in their own data set. So what they can do is if they have several examples of images from their own data set, they can use them and they can do some extra round of training so that network can grasp the patterns of the new data. And after that, we can extract the feature profiles and embed them into the interactome. Great, thanks so much. I'm noticing it's 1229. So unless there are any other um, last minute questions, I want to thank Anastasia one more time. That was a wonderful talk. And now we'll switch gears and give Michael a chance to set up. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well done. So while Michael's getting set up, I'll do a brief introduction. Michael Ballas is a second year medical student at the University of Toronto with a passion for technology, AI, and their intersection with healthcare. And his research is focused on using AI to identify intracranial hemorrhages and predict patient outcomes. Hey everyone, uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. I, I'm so glad that you've invited me. That's a really tough act to follow up, so I'll try my best. Uh, before I get started, I have a little disclaimer. I'm actually on holiday on a Greek island living out of a tent. So right now I'm outside of a hotel connected to their public Wi-Fi. So if, if things cut out, my apologies in advance. It's also a little windy here. Just uh, let me know if you're not understanding me uh, from the Wi-Fi, not from my talk. Uh, but I'll, I'll go ahead and get set up now. Uh, and here we go. All right, so I assume you can see my screen, yes? Yes. We can see it. Okay, so my talk is using AI to identify intracranial hemorrhage and predict patient outcomes. Again, my name is Michael Ballas. I'm a second year med student starting in September at U of T. Uh, and this work has been done at St. Mike's Hospital uh, with all of the brilliant people in the Division of Neurosurgery uh, and beyond. So let's. Is this going? Okay. So starting off with the background, what is intracranial hemorrhage? It would be good if, if we all had a basic idea and why is it important? Why are we using these uh, AI buzzwords uh, with this problem and do we really need it? And uh, my job here is to say why we do. So what is intracranial hemorrhage? Well, as the name implies, it's bleeding within the cranium uh, and it's been can be caused by leaky or ruptured blood vessels from like a, a blunt trauma or a stroke or anything like that. 
And these are typically subdivided into an intraaxial bleed, which means within the brain or extraaxial between brain and skull and the, and the membranes between. So let's say you have a patient who is, you know, just arrived in the ER and you want to know, do they have an intracranial hemorrhage? You can either guess, but probably a better way to do it is to take a CT scan. That's the definitive tool to make sure, first of all, do they have an ICH? Where is it and, and what kind is it? And that way you can uh, determine prognostic features. So the way CT scans works is uh, it's measured in Hounsfield units, which express intensity in a, a standardized and convenient format. So on the right here, you can see that bone, which is very dense, has very high intensity values and it's very white, whereas something like air, which isn't very dense, is black. And hemorrhage, we have somewhere in the middle here, that a uh, little white dot in the in the middle, uh, and that typically is uh, between things like white matter and, and everything else. Uh, just to note, these thresholds aren't uh, uh, very well defined. It can range from 50 to 120 and, and, and further. So uh, that, that's you know why we need the AI. It would be easy if it's just an, an easy threshold. So that was just a 2D image. Uh, obviously, brains are 3D. Maybe mine's 2D, but I'm sure all of yours are 3D and the way they represent this 3D cranium is they take multiple images uh, at different uh, points on the z-axis. So you, as you can see here on the left, there's an image here and an image here and an image here. And they stack all of these slices to represent that 3D cranium. And then the radiologist will kind of scroll through and look to see where the bleed is occurring. And then once you determine uh, where it is, you can kind of determine where the subtype is. Uh, if it's intraparenchymal, that means it's a bleed inside the brain. Intraventricular means inside the ventricle. Subarachnoid, subdural, and epidural are all between the different uh, membranes, and those are all uh, extraaxial types of bleeds. Uh, but the details itself are not important. But the, the big problem of ICH is that it's a very frequent and both and also a very critical clinical problem. It has an annual prevalence of about 10 to 50 uh, per 100,000, uh, depending on the ideology, with a 30-day with a mortality rate of about 50%. So half of everyone will die within a month. Uh, only about a fifth of patients will actually have a full recovery, and half of all of the deaths will occur within 24 hours. So that is quite scary. Uh, and we do know that earlier intervention leads to improved outcomes. So our ultimate goal here is to facilitate an optimized triaging process uh, so we can lead, uh, uh, optimize the, the earlier intervention. So another way to look at it is it's one of the most frequently encountered emergencies. It's very critical. And risk assessment also requires very uh, specialist domain knowledge, uh, particularly to interpret the radiological findings. Only a subset of doctors are, are trained enough to actually be able to tell uh, the, the risk of death for a patient and, and poor outcome. And both of these factors lead to very intense resource pressures that we're hoping to alleviate with our solutions. So, therefore, our objectives are to adopt deep learning algorithms for the detection of intracranial hemorrhage and combine them into an automated risk assessment tool. Uh, we developed three different pipelines, and I'll go through each one, starting from classification to segmentation to mortality prediction. Starting with classification, we're distinguishing between the various subtypes of intracranial hemorrhage, and uh, these are the subtypes I was mentioning earlier. So, Luckily, we didn't have to actually collect any of the data ourselves. It was all collected from these four institutions at the top here. Uh, they collected 25,000 CT exams from adult patients all over North and South America. And each CT series had between 20 to 60 of those image slices that were uh, three to five millimeters thick. And then the RSNA, ASNR, and MD.AI and the large team of radiologists and doctors went through every scan manually, labeling for the presence of these five types of intracranial hemorrhage. And then this massive data was all hosted by Kaggle, which is a Google subsidiary and big uh, machine learning hosting competition. So we took that RSNA stage one data set of 750K CT images. It was split into a 90-10 trained test. So 670,000 images were used to train the model while 78,000 were used to test it. But one of the problems with using data, especially just from a single institution and, and what previous studies have shown with, with very strong machine learning models was that when you apply it to a different institution, because CT exams are taken differently, depending on the institution, they, they break down. So we collaborated with the Chinese University of Hong Kong uh, and collected 211 uh, distinct CT exams from adult patients so we can validate 
will further validate the model effectiveness and generalizability. And now finally, we hear at the classification model. In fact, it was actually adopted from one of Kaggle's winning entrant models from team No Brainer. Uh, and this was by Dimitri Larko and Derek Hanley, both brilliant minds. And I, I thank them both for uh, creating the model. But uh, all top 10 solutions actually shared similar techniques and architecture. So I encourage all of you that are interested to, to look into them and see how they're similar and how they're different. Uh, but I'll go through the breakdown from windowing to cropping to image classification, gap layer extraction, and sequential modeling at at least a high level, starting with windowing. So when you look at an image on your screen, uh, they're represented in, in RGB. So you have a red, a green, and a blue channel, and they all kind of combine together to form the image you're looking at, just like that dog. And, and we uh, applied a similar approach where you window the CT scan. So for example, the brain, uh, you, you window it along the intensity values so that the brain will be highlighted. And then we do that for blood and soft tissues and combine those three channels uh, to form our final scan. And unfortunately the GIF isn't working, uh, but that's, that's essentially what it's trying to show. Next, we just cropped the images. So we removed all the, all the empty space and retained the square aspect ratio. And now comes the fun part, the image classification. So we just used a, a very popular model in image uh, classification, the 32 by 8 ResNext 101 by Facebook AI. Uh, this was pre-trained in a weekly supervised fashion on about a billion public images with 1,500 uh, hashtags or labels. Uh, it was fine-tuned on ImageNet. And we essentially perform transfer learning by using these pre-trained model weights as a starting point for our data set. And, and the reason we did this is because that model already knows shapes, contours, and rather than training it from scratch on CT scans, it's, it's already kind of learned basic visual cues that we can then apply and speed up and speed up the learning process and improve accuracy. Before I get on to the next component, this is uh, an important thing I wanted to mention that image slices aren't independent. For example, you're not going to have a bleed on slice two or slice four and then slice 19 because that's not how blood vessels break and how liquids travel. If, I, if you say that uh, there's a bleed on slice 12, then I, I'd be willing to bet that there's probably one on either slice 11 or slice 13 as well, just because if that's how it, that's how it works vertically. Uh, so in many ways, this is amenable to a sequential model because you can sequentially predict whether the next one will have uh, a bleed. And bleeds also usually don't occur at the, at the beginning and at the end. So we have our input image. This is what it looks like uh, windowed and cropped. We, we run it through the ResNext model and we run it through the final layer, which is a global average pooling layer to generate our uh, predictions. So epidural, intraparenchymal, all the way to subdural. Now we would train it with these predictions, but we don't actually end up using them. Instead, we extract this gap layer and, and form what we call an embedding, which is essentially a lower dimensional feature vector representation of the original image. Uh, it's basically a, a way of representing this original input image in, in a very small and compact space so that we can optimize and, and improve learning and generalizability later. And finally, so we have one CT exam for one patient, and then we have N, let's say 30 uh, uh, slices in that uh, exam. So we have 30 feature vectors or embeddings for each image slice. So we take those 30 embeddings, as well as the differences between them, and we plug it into our sequential model, which essentially consists of bi-directional long short-term memory networks or bi -SDMs, and some dense blocks and run it through until we get to the final fully connected layer and generate our probability of hemorrhage or hemorrhagic subtype for each CT image slice. So to summarize all of that, uh, on the top left here, we have our CT exam. It's a stack of slices that represent the 3D cranium. We go slice by slice, we take the original image, we window it, we crop it, we run it through the ResNext model. We don't get the predictions yet, but we extract the gap layer, the feature vector representation of the original image. We aggregate them into a pseudo 3D scan and run it through the sequential model. And there on the bottom left, we have our predictions. We have our, our, our outputs, uh, our labels, whether it's epidural or subarachnoid and uh, the slices. So for example, for slice N minus one, slice 29, we could say that they have an intraparenchymal and an intraventricular hemorrhage. 
And this is just for your interest, uh, how we trained it from hardware and software. And here are the results. So on the internal Kaggle cohort, the, those 78,000 tests, in, we had AUCs of greater than 0 0.98, so essentially near human with a log loss of 0 0.05. And our, on, on our external uh, Chinese cohort of 6,000 images, again, we have above 0 0.98 uh, AUC. Uh, unfortunately, none of them had epidural bleeds, so we can't comment on that. And again, with a, a fairly low log loss score. And now onto the segmentation. So this is segmenting blood from brain and calculating the volume of the bleed. And for this, we use the BLAST CT, the Brain Lesion Analysis and Segmentation Tool for Computed Tomography. Uh, this is based off of DeepMedic, which is a 3D convolutional neural network, uh, very popular in the medical imaging world. And for this one, we didn't have to retrain it on any images. We just used it right out of the box, out of the, out of the GitHub repo. And this was developed by Montero et al., uh, published in Lancet Digital Health. And how I'll summarize it is, is through training data sets, architecture, and model performance. So this data set, or the data was taken across 60 centers in, in Europe uh, from the Center TBI study. Uh, in the first data set, there are about 100 images, each manually annotated uh, by the authors, which I imagine took a while. Uh, and then they built an initial segmentation model to further segment the remaining 839 images, or, or at least help them manually do it. And after they've refined everything, then they generate their, their second data set and, and split it into the train and test and uh, run their models and assess it. Here is a, I'm gonna give a very brief overview of the model architecture of BLAST-CT. We have the input image on the left here, which was originally, this uh, the deep edit was originally developed for brain MRI, uh, and we sent it through the pipeline in a three parallel pathway, they call it. Uh, images, image patches are sent through with full resolution, three times downsampled, and five times downsampled. And the reason for this is first for optimization, because they all pass through the pathway at the same time. And also, so you get different views of the same bleed from different re resolutions. You have a, a very small window of high quality and a very big window for, for big gross details, but lower quality. And this neural network is 11 layers deep, using things like batch normalization until you reach the, the fully connected layers and the classification layer. And finally, the performance of their BLAST CT. So you can see on the left their qualitative results. Uh, in the top row here, you have the original image slices. Below that, the ground truth segmentations, and then below that, the predicted segmentations of the model. And it's color coded by the type of lesion there is. And you can see pretty good, if not perfect, agreement between both. And then on the right, it's more of a quantitative comparison, uh, bland ultimate plots, basically a way of uh, comparing two measurements of the same variable. So on the X axis here, we have the mean of the true and predicted lesion volume. And on the y-axis, we have the difference between the true and predicted lesion volume. And essentially what all of these are telling you is that as the volume of the uh, bleed gets bigger, so does the error, which is fairly intuitive. So this is the summary of the, uh, of the overall model. Uh, I didn't go through the image pre-processing, but essentially uh, in a nutshell, we resampled to an isotropic resolution of one by one by one uh, because it was originally made for MRI. We windowed the intensity values between negative 15 and 100, scale bounded them between negative one and one, and converted uh, the files from DICOM to NIFTY, basically different uh, medical imaging formats. Ran them through the model, and then generated our predictions, which would look something like this. So you have, these aren't slices, these are scans. So you have patient one and their full 3D scan, patient two, et cetera. And you have these labels, intraparenchymal hemorrhage, extra axial hemorrhage and intraventricular hemorrhage and, and the volumes for each. And these are the results uh, of our external cohort using that uh, tool. Uh, we have our bland Altman plot. Again, similar pattern. You see that as the volume gets bigger, the differences also get bigger. And we also see strong correlation between the measured volume and the predicted volume with uh, significance. Uh, although we found that intraventricular hemorrhage is consistently overestimated, so we are, you know, in the process of, of figuring out why that may be and, and, and working towards perhaps rectifying that. 
And finally, our mortality prediction. This is a very preliminary model and basis for our future clinical decision support plans. So we have our external scans up here. We run it through the classification model on the left and generate a hemorrhagic uh, subtype prediction. On the right, we have our segmentation model and generate our volume prediction. And then from those two values, we generate our mortality prediction. So it's very simplistic. It's a simple linear model uh, where we combine what kind of subtype it is and the volume of it. And we generate very high, surprisingly high uh, area under the curve for it of 0.913 in an external cohort of 138 patients from China. And uh, here is our summary of results. So I understand it. It's uh, it's been a lot. So I'll I'll try to summarize it all uh, briefly. So we have our ICH classification model on the left here, trained on about uh, 700,000 images, over 0.98 AUCs for any and all hemorrhagic subtypes, both internal to the Kaggle data set and ex external. Uh, to 6,000 images from China. We have our segmentation model trained on about 1,000 images from Europe with a core Pearson's correlation of 0.78, significant p-value tested on 6,000 images from China. And our mortality prediction model, which is a very simple linear model that combines what kind of hemorrhage it is with what the volume of the hemorrhage it is. And you are able to predict mortality with a 0.91 AUC. And this is tested on 138 patients from China. So at this point, you're probably wondering, I mean, it doesn't really seem that novel. We've adopted a couple of, of algorithms that were pre-existing and applied it to data that was pre-existing and then got a bit of external data. Uh, but there have been uh, so many studies uh, using AI and CT scans and especially brain scans that, you know, doing another one wouldn't essentially add a lot. I think what our big uh, premise is, isn't necessarily getting it to work, but getting it to work in practice. So our next steps are a QI quality improvement initiative and actually integrating these pipelines and optimizing them into actual real-time clinical practice, which is what we're in the midst of doing right now. So to restate the problem, there is a need for clinical decision support systems. Traumatic brain injury, TBI, it's responsible for 23% of all injury-related deaths in Canada. Treating centers uh, cover populations of up to 5 million, generating 2,000 critical referrals per year per neurosurgical center. Severity, treatability, priority are determined remotely while the neurosurgeons running clinics, elective operating rooms, and ward rounds. And as you can imagine, the system, this house of cards is prone to delays, ineffective utilization of human and material resources, and all of this can ultimately impact the prioritization of true emergencies. And, and the funny thing is, the majority of decision making is actually based on a limited number of very relevant imaging and clinical features during that remote assessment when the surgeon is between operating rooms and patients. So obviously it's appealing for us to create an automated summary of the clinical findings, uh, facilitate triage prioritization and alert physicians involved in this triage. So therefore our goal is to implement a real-time clinical triage pipeline integrated with electronic health record workflow for patients suffering uh, TBI. And, and we've thought about this through various modules and the way we envision it working is by receiving alerts from ER physicians to identify TBI cases as they arrive, automatically retrieve these cases from local PACs, which is basically sending medical images, identify imaging abnormalities using the deep learning algorithms I've described and perhaps optimizing them, and then combining them with demographics that we didn't even have uh, for this project to predict triaging decisions for surgery and deliver an alert uh, consisting of a clinical summary and, and a recommendation for doctors. So the way, you know, for a given case, the way we see it is you get a CT scan in addition to other important and relevant clinical data like the patient's age, uh, the Glasgow Coma Scale Score, which is basically a measure of neurological function. And then a few of these uh, outputs will be set, fed to a model and the model will predict one of three output classes immediate neurosurgical intervention, need for close observation due to high probability of clinical deterioration and low probability of requiring surgical intervention and intervention. And by prioritizing different patients and putting some on wait and standby and some on immediate intervention, you end up saving many more lives and improving functional outcomes because those who don't need it won't receive surgery and those who do will. And uh, so, 
stay tuned. I, I highly look forward to sending updates in the future of where we're going. We, we are well on the way to, I think, achieving this. And uh, I'd just like to thank you all for listening and thank all the authors, the brilliant authors who, who made this possible. And, and please feel free to contact me for any further questions or, or anything like that. So thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. That was an incredible talk. I'm very also jealous of your presentation location, enjoying the sun. <laughs> um, so same deal. We'll start off with our uh, adjudicator from TKRM. And then I noticed that there's already a couple questions in the chat, so we'll go there next. Alistair, do you have any questions? Yeah, I mean, that was that was a ton. Uh, so I could spend all day just, just chatting about it. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess, I guess um, two things jump out. One was, I don't know to, to what extent um, this was already in the the sort of winning approach that you you adopted, but but manually windowing the image and feeding that in feels unnecessary. I know it's I know it's necessary to window an image for us humans because we can't see sixteen bit depth, but computers can. So I was wondering, like, uh, was there was there was that actually helpful, or or was that oh this is how we're going to make it fit into an architecture that already exists kind of decision. Okay, that's a that's actually a very good question and one I can probably only half answer. Um, uh, so we don't have the resources to run, or at least I don't have the resources to to run through different options like do we window or not? Do we uh, uh, apply this many layers or those many? Uh, but the the lucky thing is others do, and during the competition there have been many different approaches. Some have windowed uh, in different ways and some haven't. And it seemed like consistently windowing and combining different channels of windowing uh, was the best approach and consistently won, I think majority of the top 10 uh, places and, and even beyond that. Uh, so we decided to go with it because of that. Uh, we only had one chance to run it uh, with, with the funding we had through the uh, Google, Google Cloud Platform uh, server. Uh, so, based on the community, I, I can say that it seems that windowing helps. Why that is, uh, it's open to interpretation. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, and then I guess you know, taking a data set from from China is uh, definitely uh, a distance learning type of thing. Um, was and and I remember, I feel like it was Mohammed who brought a data a CT uh, hemorrhage data set to a hackathon a few years ago. So I guess my question is, are there any local data sets that that um, you're working on right now or, or that sort of thing? Because it felt like, at least within the community, um, we should be able to validate it locally before you run off and, and, and try and um, try and actually deploy it. Mm -hmm. Well, the good thing about the, uh, the Kaggle data set is those four institutions, one of them is actually Unity Health Toronto. So that's fairly local. Uh, there's also Stanford, Thomas Jefferson University, and I think the University of okay. Sao Paulo. Oh, our um, data set's in the training set. Okay, that, that yeah, makes yeah, yeah. Because I remember yeah. there being a one locally, so I was just kind of, uh, I was like, oh, well, we can validate this on another data set. But I guess yeah. it's in the training set. Okay. Yeah, yeah, but okay. the, I, I don't know the exact details, but I also remember hearing that institution to institution, the actual way they capture the CT scans and, and small changes in how they capture it can also change how the model uh, uh, predicts. So by going somewhere totally around the world, uh, we, I think it's, it's even better than using something locally. Yeah. Yeah, I won't hog the spotlight. Anyone else want to jump in? So we have a question from Itamar, Eric. Michael, could you please describe the embedding in some more detail? Sure. Uh, might help if I have a figure. Uh, essentially, what the embedding is, it's, a, I believe, 2048 vector representation of what the original cropped windowed image was. Uh, oh, I'm past it now. And the idea of that is a way of representing that image in a lower dimensional space such that not only do you uh, train the model and, and use it faster, but also I think it makes it a bit more generalizable that you kind of put the most important 
uh, parts of it into that vector. So you essentially just ignore what that final prediction is from the activation function and extract this gap layer. Yes, I see there's another question that just came up from Mark Cicero that was very similar to what I was going to ask, especially, you know, when you're thinking about triaging, I was wondering, you know, could you modify your final uh, linear predictor model to predict a time to event instead? And instead of saying, oh, this person, you should probably watch them saying, okay, within the next six hours, this is their probability of actually having the event. So I'm glad Mark brought that up. That's, that's a very good question and probably something we will try to do in the future. Uh, the reason we're sticking to those three labels for now is because uh, we have those labels. So what we're doing right now is before we implement it real time, we're looking at the and how the is actually triage and using those other labels, assuming the neurosurgeons made the right choice, which I think they probably did, uh, you can tell whether they require immediate, uh, whether they require immediate uh, surgery based on how the neurosurgeon tri uh, triaged it. I'm getting unstable internet connection, so I apologize. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I actually have two, but let's start with one. <clears throat> Can one view potential brain tumor as injury in the sense that brain tumor may have some precursor signature or signs in behavior? And if you suspect that and you want to discover it very early, maybe I can apply your procedure, treating it or viewing it like brain injury. So essentially, are you asking whether we can use this model to identify brain tumors? Yes, early, uh, early detection. Early detection. There are probably better models out there that are, are built to detect brain tumors. Uh, so I would say you possibly could, and you may get decent accuracy. Uh, I haven't seen many brain tumors on CT scans uh, because that's not what I do, uh, but uh, I, I imagine you could, although there, you could certainly find better models out there. Yeah, that's interesting. And the next question or curiosity is to both speakers, can I, I'm not too familiar with this uh, deep learning neural networks and so on, but the concept started by mimicking the brain, like Hebian and all that, the early concept. And since we are talking about injury or tumor in the brain, is it possible to induce some injury in the neural network and follow it. Yeah, and there, there are examples of that. For example, there's something called uh, dropout, where after every iteration with a certain probability, you will eliminate certain neurons so that it, it becomes more generalizable. Uh, and in fact, by, I guess you could call it damaging the network, you're actually making it more robust to small perturbations. So in the, in the physical, like the human situation, it means the robustness means some kind of adaptivity? Well, I can't speak on behalf of humans, but uh, that's, that's the idea for the, for the, I guess, the model. No, I want, I want the disturbance to be closer to to the real situation, not a technical dropout, which is usually not well explained. It's just done arbitrarily. But if I want to make it closer to, to model the, the situation that happens in life, uh, it will take some, some more uh, 
you know, something more than just dropout. Sounds like Sorry. a really fascinating area and perhaps, you know, you guys can keep the discussion going offline. I just noticing the time. So I'll wrap up for today. Thanks again to our speakers, Michael and Anastasia for, for two wonderful talks, provoked a lot of discussion. Uh, their contact information is on the TCAM website. So if you have any other questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. Our next event will be occurring not next month, but I believe in October. So stay tuned for that. And thank you again, everyone for, for attending. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.